light within our hearts, light within our thoughts, light within our words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. With me today on the show, I have my friend Xenia Grant, and the topic we wanted to discuss today was autism in relation to expectations, which is fairly broad because, uh, I mean, looking at it in a typically autistic way where we see the details, you immediately have to say which expectations. The expectations we have of ourselves, the expectations we experience with families, the experience the expectations that we experience with society in general. You know, and there are probably governmental and financial and religious expectations as well. How about we touch on each of these in turn and just see what there is that if we were more aware of it would allow us to interact more effectively. I think the hardest expectations for me to meet are or more the family ones. Okay. And the reason why I say that is I come from a family of type A personalities for the most part. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and they don't really, I mean, they're understanding autism is a little bit better, but they don't super really understand it. Okay. Um, and that can be so problematic. So what do they expect of you that you are unable to do? I mean, they know that I can't tolerate a lot of high pitch noise and all that, but I, they don't always accept my eccentricities. It's more subconscious rather than conscious, because I, okay. think, you know, because a lot of expectations can penetrate the subconscious, especially if you come from a middle class or upper middle class family, the expectations that you conform to society may be a little bit more okay. pressing more of a tendency to be embarrassed when the autistic member of the family does something that's anomalous? Yes, yes. Okay. Where, well, and of course this is generalizing about the different classes. I I don't know whether every working class family would worry about it less, but it, it seems to me the further down the ladder you go, the fewer demands there would be to satisfy. That's a possibility. Um, I, the quirk of that, and yes. specifically in relation to autism, though, that just occurred to me, is that in one sense it would be easier to be an autistic person further down the economic ladder because you wouldn't have as many expectations. But then you don't get the with. services that one needs. Well, not only the services, um, autism itself, I mean, to, to diagnose autism itself is rather expensive. Oh, yes, it and is. I mean, at one point in time, I choked with someone uh, w asking whether uh, autism was a uh, wealthy, a rich man's condition, basically. I mean, they used to believe that. But because, because of fewer expectations, it would be easier to survive as an autistic in working class environments. Because of greater access to services and diagnoses and, and uh, assessment tools and so forth, it would seem that the wealthier people have the advantage. Absolutely. And not only that, but the wealthier people tend to advocate better and more for services, and they okay. tend to stick up for themselves a little bit better because they, they have... Having more education. They have the which, more education. Which the expensive means. education is not always within the reach of autistics in working class environments. That is correct. The thing to remember about expectations is by reason of what they are, expectations, most of the time, they're not articulated. Not only are they sometimes not articulated, but it's almost like you have to learn by osmosis what they are instead of it being Which spelled out. Which takes a lot longer and, and there's a lot more mistakes made along the way. Yeah, especially with people on the autism spectrum where we like things to be spelled out, we like things to be exact, and we like things to to be stated. Mm. An unstated expectation is the most difficult one to satisfy. Because you don't know if it's there, you don't know how you conform to it, or, or what, you, you just don't know what to do with it. I understand that everyone likes to have as much certainty in their life as possible. Are we better or worse 
uh, than others in dealing with that general I, uncertainty? I think we deal better when we have certainty. Mo some non-autistic people, you know, like uncertainty. I don't. Okay. I don't. I, I like to know what will happen, why, and where it comes from, and how come, and... It seems to me that most people do like certainty, but most life situations don't provide much of it. No. And the older you get, the more you realize that. Well, we hope you realize that. Obviously, there are some elderly people who never quite understood or, or haven't got around to accepting that part. You know, the, the denial, the anger, those two are easy and common. Bargaining kind of becomes a question of what resources are available to answer the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, depression, of course, has become almost an epidemic in Western society. Uh, I could hope that that will change in the future. I don't know whether or not it will for certain, but I, as I try to contemplate all this pursuit of certainty, it seems to me that there really isn't any that the universe is so filled with changes and developments and anomalies and variables that certainty, as much as I grant that it feels good, it's almost impossible to achieve. Yeah, because, you know, absolutely, that's why... Um, Having said that, though, mm -hmm. there seem to, it seems like an awful lot of the problems of expectations come from people who are correctly or more often incorrectly defining expectations. Or or they're defining expectations being unrealistic about it. That you have to be this way because that's the way people are supposed to be rather than, okay, it may be a goal to be met. Who knows? Um, I think expectations, especially when it comes to certain things like you know, whatever success means. That's a big one. Is are you successful and you and fill in the blank. Mm. I guess that would constitute expectations related to the definition. Yeah. You know, the expectation well, the expectation that we all have the same opinion on anything. Oh, absolutely. It seems that people in groups presume that they agree much more than they actually do. Well that and that there are certain parameters where opinions can be. I mean, whereas when you come out with something totally different, totally unexpected, totally what they say from left field, it's like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. I think if we could begin to name and expose the unstated expectations, though, it would benefit human relationships in general quite a bit. The challenge in, real, in reference to our current topic, though, is autism and expectations. It's that we live in a world that is saturated in expectations. Mm -hmm. And those are the most difficult things for the autistic mind to detect. And not only to detect, but to decipher and to pick which one. Because it's not one expectation, it's many expectations. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are not only societal expectations, there are gender expectations, there are income expectations, there are political expectations, there are mm -hmm. a whole bunch of others. And they're all intertwined and you can't really ignore any one of them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I and I know that in my life that you find, you know, living up to these expectations is not always easy. A lot of people on the autism spectrum have problems with that. They talk about, you know, in my experience is, you know, that, you know, it's like, you know, society expects me to do X and I do Y. And mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable with doing Y because society wants X, but how else can I be? Yeah, I guess what's more public to me, it, problematic to me, is when people have expectations and they don't tell me what they are. And then I wind up in a social situation where everything is frustrating and I don't understand why people are acting from my perspective so strangely. Uh, you know, they may not think that they're acting strangely at all, but that's because they understand why they're doing what they're doing, and I don't. But the 
understanding that everything outside of my house is this dense forest of expectations. Mm -hmm. If I have a choice, I'd rather stay home. Understood, and a lot of people on the spectrum do that. I have a tendency, I very rarely do that simply because one, my life doesn't lead to that way. I mean, and secondly, um, I, um, I have a tendency to be up and out because that helps me not to go into um, despondency. Yeah. Um, Basically getting stuck in this experience of loss. Yeah. I guess the general societal expectation is that no matter what happens, everybody will find some way through it. Supposedly. Supposedly. That's the hope anyway. And when you expect an autistic person to be able to help themselves, it doesn't really allow them a voice or an opportunity or a way of being truthful with you and saying, these are my limits. And not only that, but a lot of expectations are more surface, like you have to look a certain way, you have to mm -hmm. be a certain way, and if it don't look good, it looks funny, or you act funny, or you do something, mm -hmm. you know, and oh my God, the, you know, they're looking different or whatever. It's a lot of it's surface oriented. Mm -hmm. Let's bridge for a moment to expecta religious expectations. Mm -hmm. At one time, there were, well, should I say biblical interpretations? Yeah, I guess they're basically okay. biblical interpretations. That anyone with any sort of disability was somehow marked as an aberrant example of nature and needed to be eliminated. Actually, not in the tradition that I'm part of. Not in the Orthodox? No, no, it was never the Orthodox way. I guess I'm thinking even before Christianity of oh, yeah. uh, things like Old Testament law and such. Oh, Greek paganism, Roman paganism. Um, you, know, they ex you know, babies born disabled, you could see it. They just laid a baby out to be exposed and, you know, a lot of pagan traditions did that. And it was Christianity, and this is my personal historical mm -hmm. point of view, that Christianity liberated people from that in a way. But unfortunately, not all Christians lived up to that. Mm. But it's one more example of how expectations can create this tangled sort of web that trips everybody up. Abs on all sides. The challenge, I guess, uh, in our discussion today is how do we bring something positive to this whole arena? How do we encourage a better way of communicating that it's not so much I don't think it matters so much what the expectations are, mm -hmm. uh, but rather that those expectations be clearly communicated and that they be reasonable for the person uh, toward whom they're targeted. The ad, are they realistic or not? I mean, I'll give an extreme example. It's unrealistic to expect someone to run a hundred meters in 10 seconds unless they're Usain Bolt. I don't know the name. No. He was an Olympic runner from Jamaica who okay. can run a hundred meters in 10 seconds. Okay. And a lot of unrealistic expectations are heaped on, let's say, people with autism because, uh, you know, like for instance, you know, there's a lot of stuff, you know, and I've encountered this, but, and, but I've read it more that especially in educational settings where okay. you have to sit still and some people with autism just can't sit still. Their bodies need them to move. Even if it's rocking back and forth in their chair. Yeah, or, the, or pacing back and forth or, you know. In, in some situations, I'm sure the teacher would argue that it's too distracting. Yeah, yeah, And absolutely. so the expectation within educational institutions is, you know, in general that you will not be distracting. Uh, yeah, yeah. In that sense, it is the expectations, not the behavior itself, that is creating the problem. Absolutely, because some people need to move around. Some people need, sometimes they get their input and learn because they can move around. And that all learning stops when they can't move around. And I would say that every student needs to have the freedom to question and to explore. And we're... And with this testing, 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 uh, you know, we have to be better than the Chinese. We have to be better than the Finns. It's stomping it out. The very notion of competition, I guess, has never made much sense to me. And it doesn't make much sense to me either. I can understand in sports, you know, let's say in a track event or, 
you know, whatever. But in life... Well, except that it, it still always leaves somebody losing. I guess I'm, I'm drawn to that one line from a song by John Denver. Who's to say one has to lose for someone else to win? Uh, I think in most situations, there really are win-win situations, win-win choices and methodologies that are possible. And our society doesn't think that. It's always win-lose. Someone wins, someone loses, especially in economics. Well, speaking of which, I recall hearing of one company, I think it was somewhere in western Texas, but I don't remember exactly. In any case, they were choosing to employ people with autism, mm -hmm. and they found that it changed the entire dynamics of communication in their department. Mm -hmm. What they didn't realize uh, initially, I guess, was that the changes were all for the better. I just read that article this morning, and not about a Texas company, but about, I think about a German company. Mm -hmm. But the same thing, exactly the same thing. Mm. That, the, that the communications became clearer, better, and everybody benefited. Yeah. And in that sense, the inspiration for the upgrade in interpersonal relationships came from the person who was least likely. You know, the common complaint about autism is that it makes social interactions very, very difficult. The specific way that this uh, autistic interaction contributed, contributed to that situation, however, was that it inspired, it, it gave, provided a reason for an upgrade in communications, for an improvement in how we talk to each other. And by having that person there, there was no way they could just not get around to it or whatever. In order to interact with that person, they had to be learning uh, to deal with things in that way. And not only did language become more clear, people didn't realize how much sarcasm is used. Some of us don't get sarcasm. Mm -hmm. And how much... Sarcasm is very difficult. Absolutely. And how much communication became clearer because you had lines drawn in the sand and you knew what was being said and you knew what was being expected. And here's a line in the sand, here's Kuwait, here's Iraq, and you know which is which. Mm -hmm. Jumping a minute to uh, business world expectations. Mm -hmm. One of the biggies for uh, big issues for people with high-functioning autism is employment and how do we create the ability to sustain ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think 99% of high-functioning autistics are able to do skills for which they could be paid a living wage and so forth. The challenge is finding an employer who will, um, who will basically pick them and be willing to pay that much. And that's why you have these companies like Specialisa and, and from Denmark and, and the company, mm -hmm. the German company, SAP, and the Texas company, I don't remember the name, but the reason why is because what's happening, mm -hmm. and I, this is my personal opinion from the business world, they expect everybody to be a clone. Okay. And not everybody's that way. And then, and then they expect certain, you know, credentials and certain this and that, and not everyone goes through that way. Mm-hmm. They're almost expecting things to be mechanized when they shouldn't be. I would say that the best hope for humanity still lies within our humanness, within our ability to be to compassionately understand and to empathize and to be present in ways that machines never could. And that, and you're absolutely right. But what's happening is that is that te is that we're conforming to technology rather than technology conforming to humanity. We're becoming more. We're becoming more machine-like rather than more human. Mm -hmm. I guess the, in trying to bring all these loose threads together, it seems to me that every system has expectations and that we have expectations of ourselves. though in many cases we're so accustomed to doing them all the time that we don't even really even notice when they're there or whether they're absent or what condition they're in. And you're absolutely correct in that. You know, and a lot of it is subconscious. I mean... Uh, you know, you don't realize that you have this expectation until, it, wow, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, whether it's personally or in relationship or, you know, it, it's all over the place and we don't even realize it. The, Not even. Yeah. The, well, in general, though, but I, I guess that's where coming back to autism again, that it helps us see the details and to yeah. be aware of the intensities 
and if we can find ways to orchestrate them into a communal ritual and provide a structure for them, then everything becomes more manageable. And people, and the non-autistic people also know what to expect, and it makes it easier on them, too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, like that business we cited, when the communication was more direct and clear and there was less sarcasm and less hyperbole or exaggeration, lo and behold, the, everything about the department functioned better. They were uh, operating a profit, and, you know, there was no way management could oppose the... How do you argue? I guess it comes back to witticism. How do you argue with success? You know, that will never work. Well, I just did it. You know, well, then it must have worked at least once. Uh, the challenge, I guess, comes back to acknowledging oneself as, a, as someone who has the potential and the possibility of dealing with those challenges in that way. But the thing is, is that, you know... What what happens, especially, and I'm thinking more in the field of education, okay, uh, where especially with kids, they expect kids to be X, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of background, regardless if they're autistic or if they're from you know a poor fa Hispanic family in L.A. or if they're you know immigrants that just emigrated from Somalia mm -hmm. or you know we expect them to be one thing. Where well, it's unrealistic, and you know sometimes expectations yeah. are totally unrealistic. I suppose that kind of comes back to the question of whether there is such a thing as a truthful expectation. If truth and honesty and openness are all values that um, people with autism you know find most difficult. Well you know because a lot of us on spectrum like truth and honesty. Everybody says they like truth and honesty but I think with someone with autism, you get the less duplicity because duplicity automatically, um, so, you know, means that you have to have a certain social skills to to learn, know how to lie to someone to be one thing when you're really are another. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes and I keep trying to remember uh, a comment we made the other day as we were uh, preparing for this discussion. Um, it was something, I mean, when we say expectations mm -hmm. and the, I guess it's a common Buddhist uh, principle mm -hmm. to try to live life without expectations mm -hmm. and let things happen as mm -hmm. they will. To some extent, it becomes more difficult for people with autism because we need to process the changes and understand where we are. And, and very often I'll hear people who are going on a trip with, uh, autistic children, for example, mm -hmm. and they will give them pictures of all the places yes. they'll see along the way and do all this preparatory yeah. uh, as if you're conditioning the brain to recognize what's familiar and how it yeah. will be and so yeah. forth. absolutely. I tried to do that once myself, though, and found that the airport personnel with whom I was dealing were giving me totally uh, erroneous answers. Uh, and everything I was told was not at all the way it uh, happened. Understood. I, I know that things, you know, when I, let's say I go, when I fly a plane and all that, that it's different when the airport personnel are American than if the airport personnel are Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. There is total difference. There's a shift in the subcultural expectations yeah. also. I, I, I just can see it. I, you know, so. So on one hand, I guess to wind this up in our last two or three minutes here, on one hand, expectations can be erroneous mm -hmm. and consequently can be adversarial and may even have a psychologically or emotionally abusive effect. That, that's a possibility. You know, on the flip side, expectations, in my understanding, are only one step away from hope. That's also a possibility. You know, how do you hold on to hope without getting mired in expectations? And this, you know, that would be a very delicate discussion to have I with a Buddhist, I think. Yes, and that, I think that'd be a great topic with the Buddhists. Any summary statements as we're winding up things about expectations and autism? Not really. I think I mean, it was an interesting topic. We, we touched on a lot of different things, and, and perhaps it was a bit more rambling than usual, but it, I guess it's my expectation that whoever watches this show is not going to remember everything that we said anyway. No, they just need to glean and and learn for themselves. Well, and, and the important thing is that they find one thing that they can hang on to that gen is genuinely empowering to them. 
Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, even if it's as basic as being willing to voice one's own expectations, that instead of waiting for someone to do something, mm -hmm. to take the initiative to say, this is what I would like mm -hmm. you to do. This is what I hope you will decide. And make it clear so there's no confusion. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you very much for everything you've thank shared you. today. And thank all of you for watching. Thank you.